Uh, what powerful worship that was. What great songs that we have to celebrate what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we begin this, I want to say, uh, man, it's been a blessing seeing the church at work and seeing all of us contribute to make this holy season as powerful as it was. So thank you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, everybody that decorates, everybody that takes part in everything to make this so powerful. Thank you, choir. That was awesome. And for the last time, I'm going to say we are continuing a study in Exodus because this has been a series we've been looking at uh, since last summer. So we spent all of last summer looking at the first 15 chapters and going through the plagues and going through the bondage and praise God that the Israelites were delivered from bondage. They, they crossed the Red Sea. And as we got to this spring, when we started this up again in January, uh, we've seen how the tabernacle was to be built. And that's what we're going to look at today, and there's a whole lot that happened in between there. Quickly look at what happened. Exodus 40, verse 16. It said, This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he did. He built it. He had it constructed, the tabernacle. In the first month, in the second year, in the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moving on to verse 33, it says, And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. It was completed. But what we know as we get into the New Testament was that was just a shadow of the completed work that would happen in Christ. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to read the end of Exodus 40, but then we're going to get to the New Testament. So let's pray. Lord God, you are so good and so faithful, and we've been able to sing your praise. Praise you because of what you have done. It's been fulfilled through your son, Jesus, and we've sang all about that, the Lamb of God. But God, as we take this time this morning, I pray for anyone that doesn't know you, that they will confess you as Lord this morning. We praise you. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So a quick picture uh, I wanted to mention as we got started, or as we get started, uh, I love to go trout fishing. And... I was trying to find the perfect picture that represented a scene that I have in my mind from trout fishing. I, this is actually some random picture from Virginia, I think, but uh, never been to this trout stream. But growing up, we used to go to Bailey's Ford. It's a stream in Manchester. And we would go there, and I remember as a little boy, going down, and I found this little spot that I felt like no one ever went to. And the only way you could get to that spot was by getting on the other side of the stream, and I didn't have waders, so I had to find a way to get to the other side, and there was like this old bridge you could get across to get to the other side of the stream. And then as you got down, there was this big rock. And if you know anything about fish or trout, they like to get just outside of the current where the food might come by them so they can stay without having to use too much energy, but when they need to dart out and get something, they can, they can go and get it. And so 
The only spot way to get to the correct spot to be able to access that rock and behind it is you had to get on the other side and then there was another rock that was nice and flat. And the problem was to get to that rock, it was probably a four foot jump or so. You probably see where this might be going. <laughs> and so I remember one time jumping to that rock and successfully making it and catching a couple fish right below that spot. And so every year I would try to go back and fish that one spot. And I do remember one time going and making that jump and maybe the sand was a little soft and my knees caught on the edge of that rock and I fell in to waste high water. And that was a good experience. <laughs> but the picture I want to have is this place that we are at and the place that you want to be. There's this place where you are currently at or at one point you are at and there's this place that you know you need to be at. And the people understood this in Exodus. They understood that they wanted to be in the presence of God. Apart from him, things just were not quite right. Apart from him, they were lost. They wanted to be in God's presence. And in Exodus 40, that's what we see as it finishes up. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle throughout all their journeys. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys as they are headed towards the promised land. What a beautiful picture of God's presence as that cloud would descend over the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Man, that is just the place that we want to be. As terrifying and as amazingly beautiful as that would be, that is the place that we want to be in the presence of God. So I brought a whiteboard up here, and I don't do this very often. But I think it's a good representation of this story. There's this place that we are at, and there's this place that we want to be. And some of you have maybe seen this picture before, and you know where I'm going to go with this. But that place that where we want to be is in God's presence. And there's this gap that's between us and God, and it's called sin. Romans 6, 23 starts this way. It says, For the wages of sin is death. There's a penalty. There's a wage because of sin. It's death, and that's where we're at. And the beautiful thing about the tabernacle, and the beautiful thing about the temple that would be built, is that you could go and you could sacrifice that pure, spotless lamb. And the priest would take that sacrifice and you would get right with God. And once a year, there was a curtain and the high priest would go behind the curtain to the Holy of Holies where he could see the presence of God and the mercy seat and there would be forgiveness of sin. And you would be right with God. 
And year after year, this would have to take place. It was a shadow of what was to come. But, not sure where we went there. Here we go. There's a but in there, which is good. Oh, there it is. It's not on the back screen. Maybe I'll say this before we get to that. The tabernacle, what led the people throughout their journeys in the wilderness. It was replaced by the temple that was built in the promised land by Solomon around 100 B.C., 1000 B.C. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C., the king of Babylon, as they were exiled. And then it was rebuilt by Nehemiah and then King Herod, did a, did a renovation around 19 B.C. when the Romans were now in control of Jerusalem. I just sped you through over a thousand years of history. But in all of that, there was a sacrificial system that took place between the priest and God. Only through that could we be right with God. And another picture of that, of that temple is that there was this curtain that I mentioned and the newest temple curtain, it says in 1 Kings 6.20 that the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. And this was the same temple that was rebuilt in Jerusalem. Those cubits mean it was 30 feet high and 30 feet wide. That's how big this curtain was between the main part of the temple and the Holy of Holies. And although the Bible doesn't say how thick it was, historians have said two things, that it was the width of a hand breadth that would be like three to four inches and they've also said that it was a strong enough curtain that two horses could not tear it apart if they pulled at opposite ends. This was a sturdy curtain. So we get to the New Testament. Matthew 27, verse 45. Jesus is on the cross. It says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And I want you to, to think about this moment, this three hours of moments. The city is buzzing with the Passover taking place. And darkness comes over all the land. It's the sixth hour, which in their time is high noon. Sunrise started the day, and at the sixth hour, it would be noon. Darkness comes over the whole land, and you've got prepare, priests preparing to slaughter tens and thousands of Passover lambs and other animals. You've got hundreds of thousands of people in the middle of the city, and some say maybe up to a couple million. And for three hours during the middle of the day, you've got darkness. 
Jesus, the only pure spotless lamb, the only perfect human being to ever live was paying the penalty for all of humanity across all of time. God's plan of sending his one and only son to earth to die for the sins of the world, it was taking place right now. And for three hours, there's darkness. All these people are probably standing around and they're trying to communicate and figure out what's going on. And then it says in verse 50, then Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He died. And what happens? The lights come back on. And it says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion, those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. At the ninth hour, after three hours of darkness, all those people standing around, they hear a noise. The earth shakes. The rock splits, and there's a loud tearing sound coming from the inside of the holy place and the holy of holies as God rips the curtain from the top to the bottom. Matthew tells us it's from the top to the bottom. Luke just says it's in two, but right down the middle, God ripped that curtain. The high priest could go in there once a year and that's all and only the high priest and only for a moment to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and get back out. Access to God now had been officially activated. The Holy of Holies. It symbolized the presence of God and was closed to everyone but at three o'clock as light dawns and God rips open the Holy of Holies. He did it because Jesus Christ has officially activated access, and that we can praise God for. In the cross, we find atonement for sin. The curtain was the access to the Father, and by his death, The new covenant through Jesus alone was in effect. God split the curtain and threw open the way to his presence through Christ alone. That moment on the cross, John 19.30, before he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, Jesus said, it is finished. The work was completed. It was fully revealed. Complete. When that happened, the temple was obsolete. The high priest's work was over. All the priest's ceremonial work was done. All the sacrifices were not needed. Everything going on in that place was obsolete. It was over. They were all shadows. They were all symbols of what was to come. So precisely at the moment the priests were beginning to slaughter animals who could not take away sin, God ripped open access to the Father through the Son by the only true sacrifice that once and for all took away sin. It was complete. Full access. Not just to the Jewish people, but to everyone, even to the centurion that was filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. Hebrews 9 says it this way. It says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest for the, of the good things that have come, 
than through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with the hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, by, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. It was complete for all times. Hebrews 6 says it this way, and I love this verse. It says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For the wages of sin is death, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. It's a free gift. It's only of God. There is no other way. And it gives us eternal life. And only through the cross can Jesus give us a way to God. And that is an eternal promise that will transcend all time. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. There's a free gift that God offers you because of the cross and what Jesus did, how he atoned for your sin once and for all. And I'm telling you, if you have not accepted that free gift, do it today. Jesus made a bridge to the Father once and for all. This is the greatest news you can ever hear. The story doesn't end here. It says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for, for fear of him, the guards trembled and came like dead men dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. In John 11, verse 25, Jesus had given promise. He had said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he asks a question, he says, do you believe this? Do you believe in the completed work that Jesus Christ did for every one of us? Do you believe it? Are you going to turn away from that past life? Are you going to confess him as Lord and be in the presence of God forever? And our response should be just like those ladies it says, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. We better have great joy from this message. And ran to tell his disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me.
in the resurrection, it confirmed so many of these promises. And we get that promise of eternal life just like Jesus did when he was raised from the grave. And our response should be great joy. Our response as a church, our response for the rest of our life should be to serve him with great joy and to fall at his feet and worship him each and every moment. It's Easter Sunday. He is risen. Let's pray. Lord God, the free gift that you have given us is the best gift ever. As amazing as the temple story is, as the tabernacle, as the exodus was, it was just a shadow of what you were going to you were going to bring. Jesus, you're the pure, spotless lamb that takes away the sin of the world and we worship you. We confess you as Lord and we go with great joy wanting to celebrate, to worship you and to tell others the good news. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And it's in your name we go forward to tell others. Amen.